Sun and one. Flying at speeds of 2,000 miles per hour in the top 1% of the Earth's atmosphere, it holds every major speed and altitude record for a jet. You did all of this effortlessly, and that was the feeling you had, that you had control of so much power. It was the world's first stealth aircraft, flying over enemy territory and photographing 100,000 square miles of the Earth's surface in one hour. You were sitting at the very front of that 107-foot-long spear penetrating enemy airspace. You were truly the tip of the sword. If anything went wrong, we would be on the 6 o'clock news. Using archive film and color reenactments, heavy metal reveals the once secret and covert world of the SR-71 Blackbird. During World War I, the first reconnaissance aircraft were developed to photograph the enemy in order to gain a tactical advantage. By World War II, advanced aircraft and camera technology played a vital role in the Allied victory. After the Second World War, the world was left with two ideologically opposed superpowers. The Cold War had begun, and the United States wanted to keep a watchful eye on the events behind the Iron Curtain. America was desperate for information about Soviet nuclear stockpiling, fighter capability, and bomber threat. In December 1954, the task of creating the next generation of reconnaissance aircraft was assigned to the visionary designer Kelly Johnson and his elite team from Lockheed's advanced development program known as the Skunk Works. I think Kelly's uh, operation of the Skunk Works was probably unique in, uh, in aviation industry. To start with, he had a very, very small cadre of people. He handpicked everyone that worked for him. They were swore to ultimate secrecy. There was absolutely no leaks within the system. He was guaranteed of that. He also made it a point to co-locate his engineers and his producers, the people who were building the airplanes, so the engineer could come up with a drawing and he would walk out on the hangar floor and talk to the man who's bending metal. Can't stress enough, the engineers directly with the shop people all the time. And Kelly, when you had a problem, you'd have a meeting and decisions were made right then. He was always very fair. He could be very tough. Uh, he was no pussycat, I'll tell you. Kelly's Skunk Works produced their first spy plane in 1955, the U-2. In an effort to evade Soviet radar, the U-2 was designed to fly at an altitude of 75,000 feet. In 1956, it began flying over the Soviet Union on reconnaissance missions. But the Soviets' latest radar systems were more advanced than had been anticipated. When the U-2 flown by the CIA first began their operations over the Soviet Union, they were shocked to discover that the Soviets were tracking them even on the very first mission. Every U-2 flown over the Soviet Union was in serious danger. The U-2 was being tracked, and that was a great concern to not only to our country, but to Lockheed, who had promised that this airplane would never be seen. Determined to create the ultimate spy plane, Kelly Johnson returned to the drawing board. He began designing a new supersonic aircraft that could fly faster and higher than the U-2 with the lowest possible presence on enemy radar screens. Then, on May 1st, 1960, disaster struck. A U-2 flown by Francis Gary Powers was shot down by an SA-2 missile. Powers survived and was put on trial publicly by the Soviets, both to humiliate and deter the U.S. from carrying out any further reconnaissance flights. But with tensions between the superpowers mounting, the need for reconnaissance was more urgent than ever. 
Kelly Johnson's plans for an advanced supersonic spy plane became the number one priority. To create an aircraft capable of operating at the speeds and altitudes that Kelly envisioned, his Skunk Works team would have to overcome a series of huge technological problems. And the biggest problem that he was going to face, and he knew this up front, was going to be temperature. The temperatures that the aircraft would encounter at those speeds, phenomenal. It was clear that a traditional aluminum airframe would not withstand these extreme conditions. You could not fly an airplane past 2.6 Mach, and you'd just barely make it then with aluminum, because the airplane didn't just turn to jelly. They chose a different metal alloy, titanium. Titanium was both light enough to reach altitudes in excess of 80,000 feet and strong enough to withstand the enormous temperatures generated by Mach 3 flight. No one had ever built an airplane out of titanium. So he had to begin from scratch. We didn't even have tools that you could use to develop titanium and to bend it and to shape it and to make an airplane. So we had to start by designing tools. It was a gigantic undertaking. Creating an aircraft able to cruise at Mach 3 was difficult enough, but the Skunk Works also had to face the challenge of combining this level of performance with a new science of stealth. To avoid features that would create strong radar reflections, the plane had taken on a revolutionary shape. The wings were blended into the body, and the long surfaces on the forward fuselage were designed to deflect incoming radar waves. So were the inward angled twin fins, the pointed engine cones, and the nearly flat lower fuselage. Also, they developed a special radar absorbent plastic or composite that was incorporated into all the leading edges. When you look at an SR-71, 20% of what you see is composite. You know, it's just unbelievable at that time. And it was developed in our shops. An SR-71 was a hundred times smaller radar return than an F-14, which is only half as big and was developed 10 years later. So that was a really, truly first airplane specifically designed with stealth in mind. On December 22, 1964, the SR-71 was rolled out onto the flight line at Lockheed's Burbank plant, the Blackbird. Coated in black radar-absorbent ferrite paint, the Blackbird was an extraordinarily futuristic-looking machine. Lockheed test pilot Robert Gilliland would be the first in the cockpit. When we got going, as a matter of fact, um, for the actual first flight, it had 383 open items. Uh, these are things that are supposed to be working that aren't working. So it, it was a bare bones type of operation for the first flight. And you might say uh, these kind of things could be dangerous, but there are plenty of other people that would like to have been in my position, I assure you of that. The acceleration when we made the first engine run and they had those afterburners going in there and that thing is straining against those cables and I just felt, boy, this is really going to be something. The flight lasted just over one hour, reaching top speeds of over a thousand miles per hour, a phenomenal accomplishment for a first flight of any aircraft. Kelly Johnson was there and some of his guests were there, and I don't remember who all else was there, but the whole kit and caboodle were very happy, including me. It seemed that Kelly had created his ultimate spy plane, but would it be able to evade radar? And could it fly high enough and fast enough to escape the Soviet fighters and missiles?
Flying at speeds in excess of Mach 3, at altitudes over 80,000 feet, the SR-71 Blackbird was the fastest and highest flying jet in the world. In 1966, the first SR-71 spy plane was delivered to Beale Air Force Base in California. The first strategic reconnaissance squadron now needed an elite force of airmen to fly it. Well, my first thought was, I sure hope that I'm selected for the program. I mean, that was, that was ultimate, to get selected for the program. In order to qualify for the SR-71, you had to be very good at what you were doing thus far in your aviation career. In fact, you had to be pretty much the best at what you did to be considered as a candidate. Each Blackbird needed two crew members, the pilot and the RSO, the reconnaissance systems officer. It was extremely exciting to uh, just to get signed into Beale Air Force Base and to think that you're gonna be flying this airplane. You cannot wait. But the selection interviews and evaluations alone lasted a week and included a rigorous physical examination, the same exams the astronaut corps endured. And the first two days were physicals, an astronaut physical uh, in a sense, taking a, an EKG on a treadmill and full body x-rays, just very extensive physical exam. They also wanted to know if you were the kind of person that they could live with on the road because you had to spend a lot of time together. You know, in a sense, it's part of your family. And they wanted to evaluate people to see if they'd be a good member of that family. The pilot began his actual training with long hours in T-38s and in the SR-71 simulator. The intense simulator sessions tested the crew members to their limits. They basically made it a grueling experience. They would just give me uh, multiple malfunctions to deal with. In fact, they just keep giving you another problem on top of another problem until you're juggling five or six or seven balls at once. And eventually you have to start dropping them. And they would evaluate how you prioritized which ball do you drop. After months of training, the crews were ready for their first flight together. The extreme speed and altitude called for special protection. This came in the shape of a $120,000 pressure suit. Two technicians suit you up. You step down into it, and you put your arms into it, and it comes up to your back. The boots are separate from the suit, and uh, they're just regular, real uh, combat boots. The gloves are especially handmade for you, and they snap on with little O-rings onto your suit. Then you put the helmet on, it's quite heavy, and once they snap it down, you hear yourself breathing. And, you know, for a few moments there, you get some claustrophobia. I did anyway. The suit was designed to have 100% oxygen in the nasal cavity area and then compressed air in the rest of the suit. So that if you were to lose cabin pressure at 80,000 feet or above, um, the nitrogen bubbles in your system would come out and your blood would boil. So you need some kind of an environment around you. That's what the pressure suit provided. Suited up, the pilot and RSO are ready to be escorted out to the aircraft for their first flight together. There are three people that do nothing but strap you into the cockpit. And unlike a lot of aircraft, this cockpit is down sort of in the bowels of the aircraft. You're, you get placed down inside the cockpit and strapped in. And then the, the canopy is lowered on top of you you don't even lower it yourself. Someone has to do that for you and lock it down. You're kind of becoming part of the aircraft, and it's becoming part of you. A shot of triethyl borane gas ignites the fuel, and the J-58 engines are started. Where it really got impressive is when it starts taxiing out of the hangar. And it's 110 feet long, and so this thing keeps coming out, keeps coming out, keeps coming out. And all of a sudden, you realize that's an awesome-looking airplane as it gradually comes out of the hangar. So here, where we're looking at an airplane that's going to be going 2,000 miles an hour, and its design was so futuristic 
It was like no other airplane that had ever been designed because it was going to fly in an environment that no other airplane had ever been in. Tower Astro 3 Zero is number one for takeoff. I'll never forget how it feels to light those afterburners and feel one light before the other one does, and it jerks you pretty hard. Next us. And it accelerates rather rapidly. In just a matter of seconds, you're, you're hitting 180 knots indicated airspeed, lifting off at 210, making sure you get the gear retracted before it overspeeds at 300 knots, and you keep pulling that nose up to try to achieve uh, the 400 knot climb out. And in less than two minutes from brake release, you're pulling out of after burning your level at 24,000 feet. It's, uh, it's quite a ride. I remember the first time I took the aircraft up to speed and into altitude, I went through Mach 1. And then I approached Mach 2, and it went through Mach 2 without the slightest uh, indication of any problems, and I marveled at that. And then it rolled right on through Mach 3. Of course, none of us had ever been that fast before, but you did all of this uh, effortlessly. And that was the feeling you had, that you had control of so much power on this aircraft that it was almost limitless. As the SR-71 accelerates through Mach 3, the triple sonic boom is followed by a blast of heat radiating from its black skin that reaches temperatures of 1,100 degrees. It truly flew through the air like a hot knife through butter. It really did. So it was pointy on every end, but it had elegance. But it was an elegance that was designed for performance. After 10 months of grueling training, the SR-71 crews were ready to go. Flying over heavily defended areas in enemy territories would push both the aircraft and the crews to their limits. On March 21, 1968, the first SR-71 operational sortie was flown out of Kadena Air Force Base, Okinawa, Japan. The Vietnam War had been raging for five years, and the United States was determined to defeat communism in Southeast Asia. The role of the SR-71 would be gathering photographic and electronic intelligence of the enemies. They would fly daily over territories where one mistake could cost the lives of the crew and provoke an international incident. In this program, the, the margin for error was so narrow, almost to nothing, that it really was the pressure of flying the mission flawlessly. So that, because if anything went wrong, we would be on the six o'clock news. SR-71 missions were always carefully planned. In their briefings, the crews thoroughly studied the mission route and surveillance areas and were warned of any potential enemy threats. Well, we tried to stay well informed about our adversaries' capabilities, about uh, their, their ability to track our movement, our aircraft, any potential surface-to-air missiles that might be a, a threat to us, or any aircraft that might be a threat to us during a flight. Three hours before each mission, the crew had a medical checkup and a high protein meal of steak and eggs. The crew chief and his staff spend hours inspecting the SR-71 for any possible mechanical problems. Pre-flight on the aircraft starts around midnight. We're saying for a six or seven o'clock launch in the morning. And uh, there's a lot of procedures that you go through. Cameras have to be uploaded. The bays are in the forward section of the chines and then the cameras was electrically lifted up into it we always loaded a light load of fuel for the mere fact that it's a lot easier on the airframe it's a lot easier on the tires the landing gear and so forth like that there's always excitement in the air electrifying every time you fly the airplane it was everybody was keyed up everybody did their job and did it extremely well and took it very very seriously everybody worked together and it was a team effort, and uh, everybody knew that they was uh, striving for that one thing, and it was perfection. 
the uh, SR-71 demanded it because uh, there was no room for error. When you get ready to launch the airplane there, things are happening so fast that uh, you send the airplane off, and of course you're going to be concerned about whether or not it's going to come back. You're constantly thinking whether everything is correct or not, and, and those questions kind of creep into your mind. feet, the crew would switch off all contact with air traffic control. Only a select few knew where the Blackbird would go next. The pilot in the SR-71 spent all of his time flying the airplane. The airplane operated on autopilot, that's true, but you had to kind of hand fly the autopilot. It demanded your attention all the time, and so the fellow in the back seat, the reconnaissance systems officer, he handled all of the auxiliary systems. Sitting in the rear cockpit, the RSO must keep the plane on the black line, the pre-planned route to the target. As they reached enemy territory, he concentrates on the radar and defensive systems, trying to jam enemy communications in the event of a missile launch. We carried the same type of jammer that was used throughout the Vietnam War by uh, all of the fighters and bombers, which attempted to jam the communication between the radar site and the missile itself. Once they began the communication, our indications in the cockpit would go from warning to jamming, and it would be jamming that communication link to the missile. But sometimes, the enemy would try to attack the SR-71 by launching a missile without any radar guidance. We were coming in off the water, headed inland, and the pilot says, hey, Reg, look out your right window, and here is what looks like a telephone pole about 150 yards away that's going just straight up. He said, was that close enough? And I said, yeah, that was close enough. Our main defense, if we were fired upon, was increased speed. And we could increase 100 knots, 200 knots in just a matter of seconds, which is a lot of differential in speed for a missile to uh, cope with. Approaching the target area, the RSO would focus on operating the high-tech surveillance equipment. The six different cameras were able to photograph 100,000 square miles in one hour, producing images with such high resolution that a vehicle's license plate could be clearly identified. The surveying capability of the aircraft was fantastic because you're going in a straight line for 2,000 miles. You could look out as far as the horizon goes and from horizon to horizon, that's what you could survey. For the crews flying in the top 1% of the atmosphere, their perspective of the world was extraordinary. The first thing that you notice that's phenomenal is the change of the sky color. At, at about 60,000 feet, the sky turns a deep indigo steel blue that is so uh, mesmerizing. You just want to you just want to look at it. It, it. It's fascinating. If I flew the aircraft up near the Arctic Circle, and I might actually traverse dawn to dusk and back two or three times. I've seen the sun rise and set three times on a flight, which is very unusual. <laughs> I mean, we're actually flying faster than the Earth's rotation, so we're outrunning the sun. On landing, the highest priority was to download the cameras, called sensors, as quickly as possible. Everyone was deeply concerned that their sensor performed as it was designed to do and programmed to do. So there was a lot of serious concern there, and there was a lot of uh, happiness because the plane had made a successful mission and the crews were home. The films were then rushed off for processing and analysis. 
Well, the photo interpreters were a, a brilliant bunch of young airmen, and they could look at that film and they could spot something had been moved or a new facility was going up. Um, they were they were great at that, and uh, they would call their supervisors if they saw something of interest, you know, that needed to be flagged and brought to the attention of the intelligence people. One of the things I enjoyed about flying the Blackbird was knowing that information is power. The information we would gather could very well preclude bombs having to be dropped at all. It could save a lot of people's lives by having the right information at the right time. The Blackbird crews were successfully infiltrating enemy territory and gathering a massive intelligence about their adversaries. But with the Iron Curtain still firmly in place and Soviet technology constantly improving, how long would the SR-71 remain flying safely in such dangerous areas? In October 1973, they would face their most crucial test. In the early 1970s, the world's attention focused on the Middle East. Tension between America's ally Israel and her Arab neighbors was reaching the breaking point. On October 6, 1973, Soviet-backed Egypt and Syria attacked Israel and made dramatic territorial gains. With the Middle East caught up in the politics of the Cold War, an Israeli defeat would carry the threat of nuclear conflict. The Soviets had launched their Cosmos 596 satellite that relayed immediate intelligence from the battlefronts and put them one step ahead of the United States. It was time to bring in the Blackbird. The SR-71 would fly directly from Griffiths Air Force Base, New York, to the Middle East. The flight would be over 11 hours long with six refuelings. No Blackbird crew member had ever experienced such a lengthy, complex mission. I flew a 10 and a half hour training flight, and I was beat by the time I got out of the airplane. I said, whew, that's about as far as I can fly. But when they said you can fly 11 hours and 20 minutes, you jump up and you say, yes, sir, you know, I'll be happy to do that. I picked Jim Shelton as the first pilot to fly the mission. I knew he was an extremely reliable, highly qualified, and uh, had done extremely well in all of his training and everything. So I had total confidence that if the mission could be done, that Jim uh, would do it. On the 12th of October, under code name Giant Reach, the mission began. We took off from Rome, New York, around 1 or 2 in the morning because you want to be over a target area somewhere between 11 and 1 o'clock. This allows you to have some shadows so the photo interpreters can, interpreters can go ahead and judge elevation, but yet get you the best sun position you can have. By 10 o'clock in the morning, the SR-71 had reached its second refueling point over Portugal. Because of the highly classified nature of this mission, no one other than the tanker crew knew they were coming. On the way into that particular refueling, the uh, tanker crews said the Portuguese control kept calling out an airplane in relation to the tanker. And the tanker says, you know, we don't see anybody. Of course, they knew it was us. But I'm sure that they could tell on their scope something was happening because the two blips merged for a while, for 20 minutes, and then this one accelerates on. Jim Shelton approached the Egyptian coastline. The Egyptians were well equipped with their Soviet allies constantly replenishing their supplies. Russia was developing the SA-5, which was a missile that would go up above, well above your altitude and come back down at you. And yes, that was a concern. With 160 SAM missile sites, many secretly commanded by Soviets, and sophisticated radar tracking systems. They were on full-scale alert, watching the skies for any enemy infiltration. As soon as we got into range of the Egyptian SAM sites, they started tracking us. The Egyptians, alerted to an unidentified aircraft appearing on their radar systems, and presuming the plane to be either Israeli or American, scrambled to launch their surface-to-air missiles. 
8,000 feet above them, traveling at a speed of over Mach 3, Jim Shelton's Blackbird was gathering thousands of feet of film, capturing the extent and whereabouts of the Egyptian military forces. You had the radar receiver in the back cockpit. Gary could tell me that, yes, now we're being tracked by some SAM missile. We need to do something. So at that particular point, we would jam, we would speed up. By the time the Egyptian missiles were ready to fire, the SR-71 had already cleared their airspace and was speeding towards Israel. But the heavily armed Israelis also had no knowledge of this covert Blackbird operation and immediately went on full alert. When we rolled in on the first pass over Israel, my defensive system just lighted up like a pinball machine and I indicated to my pilot, I got all these indications back here. I said, just, you know, maybe keep your eyes open because it seems like somebody's shooting at us. Despite launching a barrage of missiles, the Israelis did not manage to shoot their presumed enemy out of the sky. The Blackbird headed back to the United States. We got everything we were tasked for, got the airplane back, and that's the first time airplane, the SR-71, had flown 11 hours and 20 minutes. After we land, the next couple of days, Gary and I get invited to the Pentagon. Uh, Admiral Moore, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, wanted to thank us for the, the work that we had done, and they showed us some photos. The photographs were detailed enough to show how many Israeli tanks had been destroyed in the initial battles we were to go ahead and resupply uh, the Israelis with some of their lost equipment. So the photo interpreters are counting the number of tanks that we would be replacing. So it was a very crucial point for the SR-71. It was a very sensitive mission and there was a lot of pressure to get that first one done. Uh, Jim and his backseater nailed them. He got all the, all the targets and everyone was absolutely elated. Eight more successful Blackbird missions supplied detailed intelligence that the war was now turning in Israel's favor. With this information, the United States was able to broker an eventual ceasefire on October 24th. I think the SR-71 contributed greatly to the resolution of that war. No one knew the airplane could fly that far and perform a mission like that and, and come back and, and uh, hand the intelligence people the product. Blackbird was also a record breaker. On September 13, 1974, Kelly Johnson's SR-71 flew in a race with the sun from London to Los Angeles across seven time zones. It took just three hours, 47 minutes, and 39 seconds. For the record-breaking flight, uh, I was over at the FAA Control Center, and uh, the controller is a huge screen, and he said, here's a 747 coming out of Phoenix. And it go blip. Blip. It moved about half inch or a quarter inch. He said, okay, get ready. Here comes the SR-71 out of uh, Canada. And it goes, and there goes uh, my antenna, and there goes Idaho. <laughs> and, and get ready, boom! And uh, it almost blew us out of way because he was right overhead. And uh, he, could, he was starting to decel, but he managed to blow the windows out of Zaza Gore's house in the Hollywood Hills. <laughs> that same year, the Blackbird flew a record-breaking flight from New York to London. 52 years earlier, Charles Lindbergh had flown approximately the same distance in 33 hours. The SR-71 made the flight in one hour, 55 minutes and 42 seconds. But the SR-71 would soon be needed in a more serious capacity. Another Soviet-backed Middle Eastern enemy was on the warpath, determined to humiliate the United States. There would be no better way than to shoot the SR-71 out of the sky. Tension between the United States and much of the Arab world continued. In 1972, the revolutionary leader of Libya, Colonel Muammar Gaddafi, announced that he was giving aid to terrorist organizations in Europe and the Middle East.
He issued repeated threats to America and indicated that those who crossed the Gulf of Sidra would be crossing a line of death. By the spring of 1986, worldwide terrorism had reached unprecedented levels. President Reagan's patience was wearing thin. Gaddafi deserves to be treated as a pariah in the world community. We call on our friends in Western Europe and elsewhere to join with us in isolating him. If these steps do not end Gaddafi's terrorism, I promise you that further steps will be taken. Then on April 5th, 1986, a bomb exploded in a West Berlin disco. Among the 232 casualties, two American servicemen were killed. The United States found clear evidence that Libyan leader Colonel Gaddafi was behind the attack. At RAF Mildenhall in England, SR-71 pilot Brian Shule knew that they were on a course for retaliation. Now we knew that something was going on because all of a sudden the Mildenhall base had a, an extra security uh, arm of guards around it. Our BOQ living quarters had armed guards uh, at the doors. The next thing you knew, every tanker in the Air Force practically was landing at Mildenhall. There were new airplanes on the ramp that you hadn't seen before. And it was no secret to every Brit aircraft spotter out there that there was something going on. The British government would allow the United States to fly the missions from their bases in England. April 14th, 9.30 a.m., the SR-71 crew members were ordered to a top-secret briefing. They were informed that the 48th Tactical Fighter Wing at Lakenheath would be striking selected Libyan targets within hours. When we heard the words, you know, this morning at uh, 2 a.m., the F-111s are launching, we were a little surprised that, well, this is for real, it's happening. The SR-71's job would be to record the results of the airstrikes against Tripoli and Benghazi. That night, the F-111s began their mission. So when we're trying to sleep in the middle of the night, you're awakened by the roar of F-111s taking off. Listening to that, it was quite serious at that time because we knew maybe some of those people wouldn't come back. By the time the SR-71 crews arrived to prepare for their mission, the F-111s were already bombing Libya. My fellow Americans, at 7 o'clock this evening, Eastern Time, air and naval forces of the United States launched a series of strikes against the headquarters, terrorist facilities, and military assets that support Muammar Gaddafi's subversive activities. Today, we have done what we had to do. If necessary, we shall do it again. The 111s had a number of targets to take out uh, missile defenses, sites and things, but also all the uh, terrorist training camps and to really hit Gaddafi's headquarters, basically, uh, to really show him that we're going to come right into his backyard. Our job was to come and assess everything that was done, uh, gather uh, pictures and, and target data for maybe succeeding strikes. Flying in directly after a bombing raid, the crews could expect Libya's sophisticated air defense network to be on full alert and eager to retaliate. We were subsonic off Land's End, getting ready to get to the tanker, and we saw the string F-111s coming back and my backseater, Walter, was counting the planes as they came back and passed us. And uh, he came up one short, and he knew that somebody had not made it home. And it was, we were, we were very sad in the cockpit at that time before we even started that we had lost an entire crew. Uh, but yet, it gave us uh, uh, more resolve. After refueling, and now traveling at supersonic speeds, they neared the Gulf of Sidra and the Libyan target area. We're doing over 2,000 miles an hour at this point, and um, we were we were like a speeding bullet except faster, and uh, we had crossed the line of death with impunity. But the Libyans, equipped with the latest Soviet long-range, high-altitude missiles, posed the greatest threat yet to the Blackbird. 
It was at that time that Walter started picking up some missile signals. He got two indications and then actually got a launch indication. And we had a big decision to make where we were, we were running into the target area before we made the turn. Do we continue to that point where Gaddafi's headquarters were, or do we make a turn away now to, to save ourselves from the missiles? And our, our decision was to push the throttles forward. We thought in 14 seconds we can beat that missile to that point and, and then make the turn. Made the turn, uh, went feet wet, got to the coast, got, and, and I will tell you, uh, that was probably the fastest I've ever seen the SR-71 fly. They'd outrun the missile, gathered the photographic intelligence, and were now heading away from the danger zone. Walt said, okay, you can you can pull it back now. <laughs> My hand was still locked in the forward position there. Uh, we were seeing Mach numbers that were a little scary that we had not seen before, and the jet did it effortlessly. Intelligence photos showed clearly that the bombing mission had been a success. It was decided there would be no need to risk more American airmen's lives over Libya with further bombing. We brought back the uh, confirmation of to whether we needed to go in again or not, what we had really done, uh, where their defenses were, what they really had. But we made a statement to Gaddafi, and if you'll notice, you remember, you didn't hear a lot from him for a long time after that. But despite the success of the SR-71s over Libya, its days were numbered. By the end of the 1980s, the cost of operating the SR-71 was no longer sustainable the Blackbird program was terminated. From now on, all American surveillance would be carried out by satellites. The reason that was given was that it was too expensive. Well, it's reconnaissance. That's, that's sometimes, because that can be very expensive. And if, if you don't have reconnaissance, uh, you're pretty blinded. And now they like to say that the satellites can do it all. And satellites can do a great deal and they're magnificent uh, uh, capabilities. But there are things they can't do and there are things that are unique that only the SR-71 can do. On December 20th, 1989, the SR-71 made a final pass down the runway at Lockheed's Burbank plant in honor of all those who had worked on this exceptional plane. Kelly Johnson was there to pay an emotional farewell to his favorite creation. You can't say enough about Kelly Johnson himself. You know, he was, a, he was an absolute aeronautical genius. Working for Lockheed, uh, I, I think he's made the greatest aircraft that ever existed. There's just something about the sleek SR-71 that uh, makes it in a class of one. There is no other. Impressive to the last, the Blackbird set four international speed records while being delivered to the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum. People love a winner. They love when someone is the best in their field. This aircraft was the best in its field. It was the prime speed machine of the world. Every speed and altitude record that it set, it holds to this day. The SR-71 Blackbird served six different presidents and saw action on hot and cold war fronts alike. And despite being shot at over 4,000 times, no aircraft was ever lost to enemy fire. It is the only operational airplane in the history of the American Air Force in which no Air Force crew members are ever killed. That's a record that no other airplane has. And when you consider the environment in which it flew, the speed, the altitude, the temperatures, that's a real credit to Kelly Johnson.